Welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. I'm your host, Ben Plumley, and this is a podcast that explores issues in global health and human rights. One of the great things about spending a career in global health is getting to meet some incredible people who do amazing things and devote themselves, in whatever way, to saving lives and improving the health and well-being of people around them. Who isn't inspired by the doctors and nurses that provide life-saving treatments and vaccines in hard-to-reach communities around the world? The cadre of health professionals across Western and Central Africa that have, and continue, to contain the spread of Ebola, well, they immediately come to mind. They put themselves at risk every day for the common good. And as they fight to contain the current outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we are heavily in their debt. And then there are the patient advocates. We think of the brave young men and women at the start of the AIDS epidemic, particularly in New York and San Francisco, who spoke, indeed they shouted truth to power, to hold to account those in authority who, partly out of fear and partly out of willful ignorance, wanted to look away as a generation of young people became infected with HIV. We think of the African women protesting the inaction of their presidents and shining the fiercest of lights onto the stigma, discrimination and corruption that prevent their sisters and brothers from exercising their rights to healthcare, free from persecution. And we think of the scientists, hunched over their microscopes, or these days more likely their computers, conducting back-breaking research into the next generation of medicines and vaccines that will treat all too familiar diseases we face every day and prevent the health challenges of tomorrow. On this episode, I'm going to meet someone who has had an incredible impact on the trajectory of infectious disease and who is an absolute inspiration to me. But first, a bit of background. One of the most significant achievements of 2019 was without doubt the sixth replenishment of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. In many ways, that meeting started the beginning, I hope, of a new decade where we embrace again the critical need for international solidarity, that together we can make the world a better place, and in the case of infectious disease, bend the arc of the threats posed by these three diseases towards their ultimate control. Now, you'll notice that I don't say the end of this or that epidemic. Well, that's a conversation for another time. But the success of the replenishment will have, I believe, widespread benefits. It guarantees the market for the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of HIV, TB and malaria for the many in developing countries where the needs are the greatest, and that will inspire more investments in biomedical innovation and create new strategies to deliver those innovations to the people who need them, helping them build healthy and prosperous lives and in turn create, as the late Julia Cleves used to call, a virtuous circle in global health. And the announcement by President Macron of France and Peter Sands, the executive director of the Global Fund in Lyon in October 2019, that $14 billion had been raised to fight these three diseases, well, that didn't come out of the blue. It was the result of intentional, hard work conducted by policymakers and advocates from around the world. And in the US, a Washington DC-based group, Friends of the Global Fight, was at the forefront of efforts that in any other setting at the moment might appear impossible to build bipartisan agreement for sustained and indeed increased investment by the US. And we shouldn't forget that US law prevents the US from contributing more than a third of the Global Fund's resources. And in an environment of deep partisan division and the threat of cuts to development aid more broadly, the pressure couldn't be greater. In season one of a Shot in the Arm podcast, we met Chris Collins, who leads Friends of the Fight, and I spoke to him at the height of his efforts to build bipartisan support for the Global Fund. And it's a member of Chris's team that we meet in this episode, Ambassador Mark Lagan, the Chief Policy Officer of Friends of the Global Fight. My career has in some ways mirrored his, although as a very, very pale shadow of his achievements. He is on the other side of the aisle, as we say, in the resilient world of polite Anglo-American politics. But as you'll see, he and I share a commonality of values and commitments. And as we navigate our way out of an exhausting and failed era of individual one-upmanship, he really is refreshing and inspiring. So we will take a short break. And when we come back, Mark Lagan will join us from his office in Washington, D.C. Well, I'm in delighted to be joined today 
by Ambassador Mark Lagan, who is Chief Policy Officer at Friends of the Global Fight. Mark, welcome to a Shot in the Arm podcast. Ben, and splendid to be with you. Oh, well, it's an absolute privilege to have you here. Um, could we start talking about your background, your education, and how you got into this? You were educated at Harvard and at Georgetown, right? What did you study? Uh, I w- studied political science, and my specialty was how ideas um, shape foreign policies of countries um, and how elites, experts, the chattering classes, as you Brits call it, uh, influence policy outcomes. And, and while you were at Georgetown, your, your PhD thesis was on uh, the role of Ronald Reagan uh, towards the end of the Cold War. And, and uh, you ascribe to him some, uh, some a, a, a leadership that I think perhaps for us Brits, we were fairly surprised to see. We, we, we sort of thought that things happened around our political leaders rather than them actually driving to world, towards the Cold War. Did you see something different? Well, that thesis, which became my first book, um, was the first in many things I've been involved in looking at strange bedful coalitions. Reagan's special quality was to mobilize a group of Republicans and hawkish Democrats together, uh, some former New York intellectuals, with his rhetoric. And so these are things one might expect of an actor with a great forensic capability. Mm, an actor with a great forensic capability as opposed to reality star. But that, that's, that's not something we'll cover here. Um, you, uh, we'll come on to your other book, um, Human Dignity and the Future of Global Institutions, in a wee while when we talk about the, the UN. But you're, so you're a political scientist and a, and a practitioner. What does that involve? Well, first of all, I'll say that my late father, the engineer, was fast to say that I'm not a scientist just because I'm a political scientist. Um, But my career migrated from the university to think tanks, to working as a House and Senate staffer, and then serving in several roles on UN, human rights, and human trafficking in the Bush administration at the State Department. And I've had some leadership roles in the nonprofit world uh, since, heading a human trafficking organization and a human rights organization. How how did you get into this? I mean, what, what is your sense of service? Uh, what made you want to to devote your career to making these changes in, in people's lives? Well, if you're interested in ideas and interested in democracy and human rights, at a certain point, you don't want to just be dealing with abstractions. I'm the son of two Polish immigrants, I feel like I have in my DNA a concern about dictatorships because of what uh, Poland was racked by first with the Nazis and then the Soviets. And uh, I got an opportunity to be introduced to human trafficking as an issue where I realized that human rights was not just about dictatorships stealing the voice of the people but responsibilities of all governments for the most vulnerable. Yeah, and, and the way in which democracies can slip in and out of, uh, of, of uh, dictatorial um, tendencies. Uh, one of the things I, I have found so interesting about you is I, I think in many ways our careers were mirroring each other's, perhaps mine a bit of a, a, a pale comparison to yours. But Hardly. W- Oh, I don't know. I mean, there we were both at the turn of the the century in the 2000s in New York, in D.C., uh, the nexuses of power, if you like, in the early 2000s. And I think a common feature that emerged then was this recognition that infectious disease and HIV particularly uh, was a threat to security. Um, I'm sort of interested to know how you came across uh, HIV in that context and context and and how you would define that threat. Well, you work with Richard Holbrook and standing up a global business coalition to fight HIV. I met him when he was ambassador to the UN and I was a Senate staffer, uh, lead Senate staffer on UN affairs. Uh, And then he worked to introduce the notion that HIV was an international security threat at the UN Security Council. But this became a searing issue for me by the oddity that I worked for the infamous Senator Helms, 
and he was visited by Bono. Yeah. And they first talked about uh, debt relief for the world's poor in the year 2000. But then they soon started talking about HIV and Helms for his infamous views uh, on LGBT issues at home uh, became seized with the problem of HIV AIDS uh, globally. Um, and if people like Jesse Helms could be on board, then the U.S. could get on board fighting this problem. See, you're describing exactly what, what Holbrook would say to me. We actually invited Jesse Helms to the very first Global Business Coalition gala dinner. And, and, and Mark, you should know, I had no idea what gala dinners were like. We never had them in the UK. So this absolutely bizarre experience of taking over, I, I think in this case, it was one of the peers in, in, in New York, um, filling it with chairs and tables, um, and then and then everyone getting up and congratulating themselves. And then this huge achievement of having um, Jesse Helms and um, the uh, the most recent president, President George uh, uh, George Bush, uh, Bill Red Clinton, Clinton sorry, yeah. coming in. And they're all sitting in the room and Holbrook saying, like, you've got to go over there and say hello. Well, why have I got to say hello? Go and do it, go and do it. Most surreal experience. But I think... You know, really for people like me in the mid-90s that were seeing HIV not just as something that was hitting the gay communities in the large uh, metropolitan areas of, of the industrialized world, but something that was ripping through like wildfire in the developing world and, and just joining the dots, that what I think folks like you did for us was to give us a vocabulary that we didn't know we could possibly have. And so once you had been able to make those connections, what did you do with that? How did you then, uh, you went into the Bush administration, how did you help uh, build the work that led to PEPFAR? Well, uh, it was really m many of my colleagues who were the ones who were responsible. I was working on UN issues and ultimately on human trafficking issues. Um, in the same era, George Bush embraced a, f a fight to help the most stigmatized, the most vulnerable for uh, sex trafficking and labor-related exploitation. Uh, and on the other side, uh, you know, he, he really championed a huge U.S. investment to combat HIV-AIDS. Um, and also, uh, the most vulnerable, uh, not just women and children, as captured the imagination of conservatives, um, but importantly, the key populations, um, you know, gay men, transsexuals, intravenous drug mm. users, people in the sex industry. Well, we'll and come these back. To, we'll captured come, me. We'll come back to those in a moment. I, I, you know, as you look at the still sticking with the infectious disease uh, threat as a, a social uh, as a security threat. Do you think those threats have changed? Um, was that sort of that that golden era of bipartisan action of the 2000s? Do you think we we did what we needed to do, or or, or have things changed? Well, it is remarkable then what got done uh, in a heyday of UN AIDS, the Global Fund, PEPFAR, all standing up efforts, um, and that bipartisanship was essential. You know that bipartisanship isn't entirely gone. Mm. We live in the most snarky, nasty, um, zero-sum game era politically, but there still is a robust bipartisan support for fighting the three most deadly infectious diseases in, uh, in the world, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things that, that I think has helped you know, cement that and join the dots on that is the way that we involve the private sector. And and, and that was one of the things I, I really wanted to get your thoughts on on this show. Um, if, if there's, you know, one of the many things I've learned about you in, in the year and a half that we've been working together is that, you know, although we're on different political aisles, it might seem, we have a, a great commonality in the way that we see the role of the private sector. You yeah. see, you, you know, not necessarily as a a source of funding, funding from, you know, corporate contributions, that's all good and well, but really as partner, as champion and advocate. And and I, I wonder if you could share with us your sense of how you see the private sector helping societies provide healthcare to their citizens. 
Well, you know, the deeply unsatisfying to the corporate community is when government or nonprofits come to them and say, well, we're the brain and you're the wallet. Now, funding, philanthropy, uh, contributions are deeply important that the Global Fund uh, got the private sector to commit, you know, one billion dollars in its latest re replenishment is considerable. Mm. But it's, of course, the know-how of businesses, uh, of what they offer, understanding supply chains to deliver medicines uh, that have not expired to the most remote places, um, the innovation, the new approaches for faster-acting drugs, um, preventative medicines, effective diagnostics. Those are the things that have to be mobilized. And, and so I, I think we... Yeah, and I, no, and I was just going to say that the the other thing that struck me from that era was the role of the business sector as employer, and 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 really building off the sort of post war settlement in the United States, where it was the private sector that provided healthcare for, uh, for the country's citizens, and there was a there was a phase I think. Uh, in the 2000s, where it became very clear that the uh, that large employers could provide treatment, could provide prevention, could tackle some of the stigma and discrimination head on, and and that's where we sort of um, really made an investment, and where I think you know I think the roots have 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 really established. Um, but that doesn't take away from the role of the the public sector in whatever way of setting standards uh, and perhaps I providing agree. for you know the safety net. Uh, it's really important complementary partnership. Uh, businesses aren't angels, and they have a stake in workforces, consumers, the communities that they work in having um, healthy people. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why they were concerned about people not having malaria in a country where they had subsidiaries or partners um, or what have you. The government and Public sector institutions play a crucial role in norm setting and monitoring. So if you think about the roles that the World Health Organization and UNAIDS do best, it is saying, what are the goals? What are the standards? How are people doing? Mm. Um, the data. Uh, and that's true for domestic governments as well. But the fact is, no matter how much one model for health provision would be the government doing it all. Um, practically speaking, whether you're an American or a European or someone in the global south, it's more likely that some blend of the private sector providing health care and those things that it relies on, commodities, technologies, innovation, um, that's going to come from the private sector as well as this vital role for infrastructure and monitoring and norms from governments. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Lance Toma, who heads up the San Francisco Community Health Center. It, it's out here in San Francisco, and it it uh, describes itself as providing a safety net to those who fall through the safety net. Um, and, and that's not something that I think is just common to, to large industrialized cities. That's something that one sees right across right across the world. And, I, and I, I, I wonder, Mark, do you see the private sector having a role in picking up where the public sector can't? So in other words, does the, public, uh, does the private sector have a role in being that safety net for those who fall through the safety net? Well, it certainly has a role in what it has to offer, its means, its know-how, it also has a stake in the communities where it's working. You know, in San Francisco, where you live, or, uh, you know, uh, Mumbai, if people are homeless or left behind or uh, in, in Mumbai dying of TB and slums, um, a holistic view suggests that businesses have a moral responsibility as well. But that shouldn't let public authorities off the hook. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a little like the United States over relying on the military in its foreign policy and under investing in non military elements. We shouldn't just say, well, we've got a big private sector, so they should do these functions. Wow, that's um, very hard. But they have so much to offer. <laughs>
you know, not just rely on the military. We've got a di diplomatic corps, my word. Um, just, just one other thing around the private sector, and, and that's around the, 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 uh, the intricate, 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 no, oh, the close relationship between the, uh, the uh, biomedical sector, academics and the public sector. And I know this isn't entirely your ballywick, but but a lot of the innovations that have happened in HIV and in, in increasingly in TB, but we also see it outside that, say in Ebola and pandemic flu, they've come from partnerships where academia have um, developed mm -hmm. Uh, products that have been then uh, uh, researched and developed by companies, perhaps with some public sector funding. And, and it, it, it's something that's happened for a number of years, but it has upset increasingly sections of, uh, of the community that conclude that, that pharma perhaps benefits from research that's done in academica, ac academica and the public sector, and that it wasn't their own. And, and, and I think the story is much more complicated on that. But I, I don't know if you have any immediate thoughts on, on that sort of intricate relationship. I, I, I think a lot about it. Uh, I mean, the government and academics uh, spur essential things in uh, innovation, in addition to the companies whose intellectual property, you know, we try to preserve so that they have an incentive to invent more ways to say lies. Um, companies shouldn't uh, bilk customers based on things that they didn't invest in, um, but there has to be an incentive. And so those purists who deny the intellectual property argument, or though my wonderful friends in the civil society community who at times, demonize business have to realize we're not going to solve these problems without the engine of innovation and getting these technologies and commodities out there if we had to rely on bureaucracy frankly if we had to rely on the world health organization to facilitate getting innovation approved and out there without the driver of business um so many people suffering from infectious disease will be left to die. Yeah, and 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 I got to be honest, that is a view I share. I mean, and I, I we both have good friends who have who have different views. I, uh, you, you know, for me, it's about being clear about what the responsibilities are, and the idea of a strong global tr guideline setting organization like the WHO makes absolute sense. Having it act as a global regulatory body is is something altogether different. That's right. Right, and then that sort of brings us on to these multilateral uh, organizations, the international organizations, and 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 the one that I think uh, that is at the forefront of our minds at the moment is the Global Fund, and I'd love to get you to to talk a bit about that. Uh, to my mind, it's an extraordinary achievement. Back in the two thousands, as you said, bringing together bipartisan support and bringing the 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 various strands of the business sector. Um, its know-how, its advocacy. Have you ever seen the business sector rally round a social cause in the way that it has around the Global Fund before? Well, I, I mean, I want to give the business community credit for other good things it's done on other issues. But there's, a, I think, a reason why businesses are attracted to the Global Fund. The Global Fund is a bank. It is run in its governments in a multi-stakeholder way, and it insists on those implementing projects that it funds be multi-stakeholder as well, which is to say, not just a voice of governments, but a voice for civil society and for business. And that's attractive. It is uh, highly focused on impact mm. and measuring. I know from my own work on human trafficking, where the data about how many people are victims, whether uh, uh, interventions are working, that data is soft, soft, soft. But the Global Fund is insistent on demanding outcomes and showing evidence of it. And since 2002, by a reasonably cautious estimate, uh, it has averted the deaths of 32 mm -hmm. million people from AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. But, and that's been really helpful, I think, from grabbing the low hanging fruits over the last 20 years. 
But but we know we're in an era where the challenge is going to be reaching those that are most at risk. And 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 if you like dealing with stigma and discrimination, dealing with with prevention. How do you document that you've averted a prevention? These are softer softer issues, harder perhaps to to document in the way that we could potentially document testing and then treatment. And and I really wonder your work um, in human trafficking, something that you got very passionately involved in while you were working for the uh, the Bush administration. Now now that's an area where uh, this is in a sense uh, the touchy feely, the carey sherry. This is about uh, breaking down, you know, one of the last taboos of the 20th century, the the appalling uh, trafficking in human labor and, and indeed sexual exploitation. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you got into that and what is your passion there? Well, I worked at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, and around 1999, I was assigned to help uh, a very conservative senator, uh, Sam Brownback of Kansas, a Christian conservative, and then Paul Wellstone, the leftmost senator uh, at that moment from Minnesota. He sadly was uh, killed in an, an accident. Mm. Um, but they had legislation on human trafficking, and I was assigned to help them uh, finish the conference with the House to finalize the legislation. And I had my eyes opened that human rights was about the most vulnerable and any government being responsible for looking out for those people and no category of people being treated as less than human. Um, if you were in the sex industry, if you were a migrant, whether a guest worker in a Persian Gulf construction site, or an irregular migrant who'd been lied to about what your agricultural work was mm. going to be, um, you were human too. And there was a responsibility of people to uh, you know, help them out. Um, I lucked out and, and I became the ambassador to combat human trafficking. I wish I were so sly to know that the office – uh, created in the State Department by the legislation I helped a wee bit to finish um, would yield me a great opportunity. Um, but I worked at the Human Trafficking Office to tilt the focus from only sex trafficking to also labor-related trafficking. And later I headed a nonprofit, the leading one in the United States, um, on human Polaris. trafficking called Polaris, mm -hmm. named after the North Star that slaves followed in the Underground Railroad, the imagery of slavery being the human trafficking uh, metaphor. And and you also dealt with very explicitly the kind of sexual exploitation that, that comes with human trafficking. And, and that, in a sense, brings us back to, um, certainly to HIV. Um, yep. Did you see connections between what you were doing in global health and what you were then doing in terms of combating human trafficking? Well, of course. First of all, it's the marginalized, those who did not have access to justice or medical systems and so on, the ones left out. You know, it's horrible when someone is most vulnerable to a threat like uh, infectious disease or human trafficking because of the group they're in, but then they're blamed for it. Mm or don't have access to the government services or the protections um, to rectify the situation. Um, I saw that connection. Of course, there also was a, a great debate. What do you do when people are in sex work uh, and you're balancing between trying to prevent the exploitation and the public health issue? If a child's in a brothel uh, in India, is the um, important step to have a raid and get them out of the brothel or to have public health, uh, public health interventions to make sure that while they're being exploited, um, they, they don't get HIV AIDS and, you know, themselves suffer and uh, spread the, the disease to others. Yes. I mean, it, it, in a sense, that's taking harm reduction to, uh, to, a, to a much further, further level. Um, and of course, in our movement, 
Uh, certainly between consenting adults, there is that whole movement around sex work, which should be seen as very different from um, uh, that, that kind of exploitation. I mean, it, it, it is complex. Uh, but the issue, I think, that's relevant for this conversation is is providing services for those who fall through the safety net, for those who are the most marginalised. And, and it is interesting that we can come together and recognise a role of something like the Global Fund in driving countries, because it is the bank that, that funds those countries' initiatives, really to develop programmes for those communities. And those communities are going to be critical in getting us to the last mile. On I, the I feel very strongly about this. The great success of the Global Fund's recent replenishment shows faith in it. The U.S., the U.K. during Brexit, Italy with its populist governments and changing every few months pattern of governments, they all rallied to strongly support a big boost in funding for the, for the Global Fund for a $14 billion replenishment for a three-year period. Increases of 15 16% each each from those countries. Why? Well, um, they have faith in the institution, but I know from Peter Sands uh, as the head of the Global Fund that that added money gives more leverage to encourage governments to do the right things and to make sure not to leave behind those stigmatized populations that are the hardest to reach um, and are essential to reach epidemic control. Yeah, and I think the, the group that you the, the, you and, uh, and our dear friend Chris Collins, who was on the first season of A Shot in the Arm, the work that you did that was absolutely essential in making sure that in this crazy world there was bipartisan agreement in the United States <clears throat> about supporting the Global Fund at this critical stage. I, I think, in a way, the replenishment conference in Lyon in October 2019 that was the start of this next decade that was a that that was the statement of hopefully optimistically uh, a recommitment to international solidarity to do things together and and pool our resources i you know I just give you a tableau i'm in lyon President Macron is challenging all the donors to step up and meet this audacious goal of an increase for the Global Fund. Bono and Bill Gates stand up with him to you know, reinforce that challenge. And I'm with an American delegation announcing the U.S. commitment mm. that they had raised the U.S. appropriation for the Global Fund for the first time in six years, yeah. and they intended to follow through for three years. And we've got a liberal Democrat from California, Pete Aguilar, and then a, a conservative Republican from Alabama uh, who has socially conservative ears, Martha Roby, they're representing their two parties uh, and firmly saying the United States is still here uh, and still thinks this is important. Yeah. Even with the mess going on in our political system. Yeah. I mean, that was electrifying. And of course, the issue for us in the United States is that we might want to give three year commitments, but it's these annual appropriations. Right. And that I know is what you're you're on to. Now, any conversation about uh, about global health could not we, we can't bypass the question of global health infrastructure. And, and you know, it's, OK, it's a, it's sort of a post-Cold War concept where we, we sort of manage our collective health and other issues t together. Um, and, you know, and again, I'm just thinking of our paths sort of touching, maybe not, not quite crossing back in the day. But while I was at, at UNAIDS, I worked with Peter Piot to support um, uh, the engagement and, and, and really bring in and make sure that PEPFAR was a, was a success, first with Randy Tobias, then, then Mark Dybel. And, and we did some work with the, um, with the journalist James Traub, and, and it is so funny, and I just want to tease you about this, because you make an appearance in what I think was a defining book that he wrote, Best Intentions, and it was about you know, the, the role of the UN and uh, uh, American power in the 2000s. And he calls you one of the few representatives of the hard right in Foggy Bottom. Foggy Bottom, I presume, referring to the State Department. Yeah. But I, I, 
that is just so not you. There is no. Yeah, it's not. Uh, there's there's no um uh uh there's 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 nothing sort of hard and ideological about you. And I and 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 I so so I really would love to understand why the global fund is so compelling for the for the generation of the of of folks who you know might be considered the center right well first of all i'm not hard right and it's a simple conclusion by a very serious journalist that if i worked for jesse helms for three (laughs) years i must be hard right i mean that's you know something i can understand um for those who are on the center right who find you know the market appealing um those conservatives of the past who cared greatly about promoting human human rights um that may not be true of trump republicans um there's a great appeal to the to to the global fund it was seen as more nimble than some traditional Mm -hmm. intergovernmental institutions which is to say the un's good but you need to include multi-stakeholder partners. I mean, Kofi Annan, as the Secretary General, and his wingman, Mark Malik Brown. Um, oh, Lord Malik Brown. Had, yes, yes, yes. You, you, you needed to harness the the power of uh, and know-how of the private sector and include civil society. That's going to happen much more easily if you have an institution that is multi-stakeholder in its governance and insists that those who receive the funding to implement are mostly stakeholder too. Yeah, and, and and I suppose UNAIDS could almost have been a sort of slight test run for that. It's program coordinating board. It doesn't have a business voice, but it does have civil society voices. Right. Um, and so that that was a challenge. And and I mean, and as we enter 2020, we have a new UNAIDS, a new UNAIDS um, executive director with um, Winnie Bio Nyama. And I, I wonder, you know, what advice you have for her as she starts on, on her journey? Well, uh, she starts with the right premise. She comes from civil society and she knows that civil society is at the heart of this effort. UNAIDS offers special roles, setting the goals, setting the standards, and as monitor, the one that, you know, counts uh, how many people are suffering from the disease or saved from the disease. Um, But it needs to unleash civil society. If you do not have civil society insisting that domestic government authorities um, protect the most hated, stigmatized, marginalized, ignored, so-called disposable populations, um, you don't have a solution. So I do want to say that where the Global Fund has leverage um, or authorities are pressed to do the right thing um, by UN standard setters, it really is incumbent upon business and the U.S. government to have programs that empower civil society. Someday, we're going to ramp down some of this international aid and even to have the same level of international aid or more as needed to end the three epidemics of AIDS, TB, and malaria. There has to be civil society pushing their government to commit their own resources and to help those most in need. Mm. Uh, and not just ignore certain unfavored minorities. And and I think you, you know that that is where I think the deal between um, uh, the various shades of left and the various shades of right can come together. Um, what happens once we've uh, touched wood, um, brought these epidemics under control? That that will be a different discussion. But but in this in this phase and to my mind this is going to go on for pretty much all of my adult life it's i I don't share the enthusiasm and optimism that it will be it'll be something that we can do and eradicate within this decade although you know let let, let's aim for that um mark some a a final thought We're, we're up to our time now but um you have always struck me as highly positive and optimistic. And I, I really wonder, how do you maintain that optimism? What drives you? Every human being has value. 
we have signals from the most secular um, understandings of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and our own faith. I happen to be an Episcopalian, an Anglican. Um, and My mother will be very have, happy. All human beings have value. Um, and they're assets. Uh, and we have to make sure some are not just treated as disposable. Uh, and for me, that that's what drives me. And it, it's a hopeful thing. If you can, as an advocate as I am now, or an academic as I have been in other chapters of my life, or a policymaker in yet other chapters, and just a little bit make sure that some people who don't have access to justice or access to health systems um, who are vulnerable and sometimes hated and blamed for their own lot, um, that's a privilege. Well, with that, Mark, I just want to say thank you very much for being on the show. Um, please keep up the incredible work that, that, that you and Chris Collins are doing. Um, Mark Lagon, you are a shot in the arm. Thank you. <laughs> Great to be with you and to work with you, Ben. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Thanks to Ambassador Mark Lagon and thanks to our director and producer, Eric Espera of Newsdoc Media. Thanks also to Brian Regas and our intern, Will Lansdale. And finally, thanks to you. As always, let us know if you have any comments on this or any other show, or if you have thoughts on subjects you would like us to cover or guests you'd like to hear or see on the show. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and YouTube. And remember, you can subscribe and download this and past episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being a shot in the arm and have a great week.